The following is going to be a brief tutorial on perineal anatomy and we're going to kind of go through it by uh, tracing it on these multiple schematic images. And the first thing uh, to appreciate is that the peritoneal lining is one contiguous lining and uh, it lines the abdominal uh, cavity where it's called the parietal peritoneum and it also lines a whole bunch of organs within the uh, abdominal and pelvic cavity and when it lines those organs it's called the uh, visceral peritoneum and it's also um, kind of has multiple foldings upon itself and uh, that results in things called peritoneal ligaments which will go through mesentery is a type of peritoneal ligament the omentum is another type of peritoneal ligament that's associated with the stomach so there's a, and there's a different types of omentum which we're going to go through and this all kind of splits the abdominal cavity into different spaces we're also going to go through that so let's start tracing and i'll start with the sagittal diagram over here just to orient everybody on this particular diagram this is going to be anterior and that's going to be posterior and these structures here, S is for stomach, T is for transverse colon, J is for the jejunum, SC is for sigmoid colon, this is the bladder, uterus, and rectum, and this is the pancreas and the duodenum. So we'll start off by drawing the peritoneal lining, really the parietal peritoneum as it lines the hemidiaphragm over here, and it's gonna be completely opposed to the abdominal cavity. And the important thing to understand is it's not even seen on uh, normal images, only when there's pathology like ascites or carcinomatosa, you end up seeing it. Now, as you go down here, you reflect upon the pubic symphysis, which is this bone over here, and go above the bladder and go into the space between the bladder and the uterus, and then again between the uterus and the rectum. So this is called the recto-uterine space. I'll just stop for a second here. This space is also known as the pouch of Douglas. So I'll just put P-O-D for pouch of Douglas. And this is an important space to remember because it's one of the most dependent spaces in the pelvis. And so fluid likes to accumulate in this location. When you're looking for free fluid, it's a good place to look. So as the perineal lining goes cephalad, uh, lying in the posterior abdominal wall, it's gonna kind of suspend a whole bunch of different organs. So the first is the sigmoid colon. It's gonna go upwards again and do uh, a similar thing for multiple loops of jejunum, completely folding it up over here. It's gonna go upwards again and do the same thing for the transverse colon. And so, as a result, you have these uh, little suspensions, and each of these ligaments has a name. This is actually known as the transverse mesocolon. So I'm just going to put transverse mesocolon for this. This suspension is simply known as the mesentery itself, or the small bowel mesentery. And uh, this is the sigmoid colon mesentery. So let's just call it sigmoid colon mesentery. Now I'll just continue drawing the peritoneal lining as it now lines the liver. So it's now known as the visceral peritoneum. And then when it comes to the undersurface of the liver, it extends inferiorly, starts to line a portion of the stomach, and then kind of drapes downwards. Takes this U-turn, goes upwards again, just like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw the um, posterior aspect of the peritoneal lining. So we'll draw it as it lines the liver. So again, it's the visceral peritoneum over here, lining the liver. It's going to go downwards, and it's going to start to line the stomach a little bit. And again, drape downwards, go upwards, going upwards again, lining the posterior abdominal wall, portion of the hemidiaphragm and terminating over here. Now there are two other ligaments that uh, are important to know about that are formed by these different foldings of the peritoneum. The first one is the greater omentum and that really refers to this uh, area over here and you have all these peritoneal linings. There are actually four layers of peritoneum. So I'm just going to go and just uh, draw a little circle around this and go geo for the greater omentum. The second one is the lesser omentum. All right, the lesser omentum is going to be up over here. So I'll just draw a circle around this one and go it over here, and this is the lesser omentum. And it turns out that the lesser omentum is actually composed of two individual ligaments, um, which are not seen in this uh, particular frame, but I'll show it to you in the other um, uh, diagrams over here. And those two ligaments are the gastrohepatic ligament and the hepatoduodenal ligament. So they make up the lesser omentum. Now, all these uh, peritoneal linings and ligaments over here split the abdominal cavity into two components. The first component is the one that's kind of enclosed by this magenta coloring. So all the way up here, and certainly all the way around here and into these spaces, the pouch of Douglas is contained within it. And I'll just uh, write over here, it's known as the greater sac. So this is all the greater sac, so that's the majority of the abdominal cavity. And if there's a greater sac, there must be a lesser sac. And the lesser sac is kind of delineated by this green color over here. And so this is known as the lesser sac. And the greater sac and the lesser sac actually communicate via, a, via the foramen of Winslow. And that's something that's quite a difficult to see, but it's usually seen you know, around this location. It's a little opening that allows communication between the lesser sac and greater sac. So I'm just going to draw that over here and call it the foramen of Winslow. And it's also known as the epiploic foramen. And last but not least, you can see that there's a little portion of the liver that's not surrounded by peritoneum. And that's actually known as the bare area of the liver. So that's a 
region where if you have a lot of abdominal ascites, for example, you're going to see a, a portion of the liver that does not have that ascites because there's no peritoneal lining that's enclosing it. So let's go ahead and uh, see some of this peritoneal anatomy on the axial images. And just to orient everyone, D1 means the first portion of the duodenum. G stands for uh, stomach, and S here is for spleen. This is the pancreas, the kidneys, the liver. The blue structure here is the portal vein, while the red dot is the hepatic artery, and the green dot is the bile duct. So we'll draw, start drawing the parietal peritoneum in the right upper quadrant. And we're going to go across as it lines the anterior abdominal cavity anteriorly, out laterally. And remember, it's completely opposed to it over here. It's going to go upwards, envelop a portion of the tail of the pancreas, Go anteriorly again and slip over here inferiorly and line the posterior abdominal wall over here. Now we'll go ahead and draw uh, the visceral peritoneum in green. Again, with the visceral peritoneum as it lines the liver. It's going to go and really envelop uh, portions of this portal triad, first portion of the duodenum, the stomach over here, and it's going to go all the way and envelop the spleen. So as you can see, the spleen's an intraperitoneal organ. It's going to come back upwards, fold upon itself again to form a ligament, which we'll talk about. Go over the stomach, go over the first portion of the duodenum, envelop the portal triad over here, go around the liver, closely opposed to the liver, round again, and upwards terminating with the parietal peritoneum. Now as a result of all these foldings, we're getting at a bunch of ligaments that are nicely seen in the axial plane. The first one is the falsiform ligament. So we're going to see that over here, falsiform ligament, the right upper quadrant. The second ligament, which we'll talk about, is the gastrosplenic ligament. And we can see that over here, all right, gastrosplenic ligament. Another ligament, kind of the left side of the abdomen, is the splenorenal ligament. So it's going to be a ligament that's formed from these layers of the peritoneum, and it's going to connect or at least go between the left kidney and the spleen. So that's going to be the splenorenal ligament. Another ligament uh, that's important to point out is this uh, region of the peritoneal lining uh, between the first portion of the duodenum and the liver. So that's going to be approximately you know, this location over here, and that's actually the hepatoduodenal ligament. And as we remember from the schematic uh, diagram over here, the hepatoduodenal ligament plus the gastrohepatic ligament makes up the lesser omentum. We don't really see the gastrohepatic ligament too well in this diagram. It's going to be a portion of this green peritoneal lining as it extends up to the liver, but together that's going to make up the lesser omentum. The greater omentum, of course, hangs from the stomach, goes inferiorly. So again, we don't see it well in this plane, but you can imagine this going inferiorly, kind of draping over the transverse colon and the anterior abdominal cavity, and that would be the greater momentum. Now as a result again of all these ligaments, there's going to be a bunch of spaces that are nicely seen in this plane. The first space that I'll point out is seen to the right of the false form ligament, that's over here, and that's known as the right subphrenic space or right subdiaphragmatic space. Okay, just beneath the uh, right hemidiaphragm if you look at it on the coronal, so that's all this space over here. The next space is to the left of the false form ligament, and that's going to be the left subphrenic space. The next space that I'll point out is seen between the liver and the kidney right over here, and this is known as Morrison's pouch, also known as the hepatorenal recess, and this is important because it's one of the most dependent places that fluid likes to collect when the patient is lying supine. So the pouch of Douglas, or the rectouterine space, is one of those dependent portions when the patient is standing, when the patient is lying down, Morrison's pouch where the hepatorenal recess becomes important. So as mentioned on the sagittal diagram, you know, we have two big spaces in the abdominal cavity, the greater sac and the lesser sac. And in this instance, the greater sac will be the space that's really delineated um, on the outside by the purple lining, which is the parietal peritoneum, and on the inside by the green lining, which is the visceral peritoneum. Now the lesser sac is going to be very difficult to see, but it's going to be this potential space that's uh, in this location that's lined by uh, portions of the visceral peritoneal lining over here. As you can see how laterally it's delineated by the gastrosplenic ligament, posteriorly it's delineated by some of the visceral peritoneal lining, and it actually communicates the lesser sac with the greater sac via the epiploic foramen. Now this is difficult to find on imaging, the exact location of it, but in general if you see the portal triad and kind of the head of the pancreas, it's going to be kind of somewhere in this location. Remembering of course that these two structures are closely opposed to one another uh, in, uh, in actual anatomy, and so this allows communication between the greater sac and the lesser sac. So I'm going to finish off delineating the peritoneal anatomy on the axial slices by going through uh, this image over here, which is just a little bit inferior to the one I just drew on. So I'll just uh, demarcate J over here for jejunum. This is the ascending colon, and this is the descending colon. 
Now I'll go ahead and draw the parietal peritoneum as it lines the anterior abdominal wall. Now you're going to go out laterally and reflect over the ascending colon, come to the midline, form a portion of the small bowel mesentery as it envelops uh, this jejunal loop and it reflects upon itself again. Goes out laterally and again goes over the anterior aspect of the descending colon and then is contiguous once again with the anterior abdominal wall. So we're familiar with this kind of lining of the peritoneum, which is essentially a small bowel and mesentery. And the space I wanted to point out now is lateral to uh, the colon over here. It's actually called the paracolic gutter and on the left side over here. And this is important because these are also dependent portions in the abdominal cavity. So somebody's lying down, uh, there's a tendency for fluid to connect over here. Now on the right side, this really communicates with Morrison's pouch, with the right subphrenic space, and for the most part on the left side, it also communicates with the left subphrenic space. Uh, however, there is a ligament on the left side of the abdomen that forms a sort of incomplete barrier such that fluid doesn't always necessarily uh, communicate from the paracolic gutters to the left subphrenic space. Now let's finish off by talking about some of this anatomy in the coronal plane. Now it turns out that when we kind of talk about the peritoneal cavity, we actually use the transverse musical in this structure over here as a way to kind of delineate different components of it. So let me show you what I mean. Here we have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon, sigmoid colon. So the transverse colon is kind of this structure here, and it's hung by its mesentery, which I'll just draw uh, and shade in purple over here. And uh, the transverse musical colon over here actually splits the peritoneal cavity into two components. That component that's above it, called the supramesocolic space, and that component that's below it, that's called the infra-mesocolic space. Now both the supra and infra-mesocolic spaces are split into a right portion and a left portion. Now if we focus on the supra-mesocolic space, we'll be familiar with a lot of the structures. There's of course the false form ligament, which extends from the anterior superior aspect of the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. And this in fact is the delineation that splits the supra-mesocolic space into right and left portions. The space to the right of it, below the right hemidiaphragm, is known as the right subphrenic or subdiaphragmatic space, and the space to the left of it is known as the left subphrenic or subdiaphragmatic space. There are additional ligaments we can see in the supramesocolic space of the peritoneal cavity, the one that goes from the stomach to the spleen, which is the gastrosplenic ligament over here, the one that goes from the spleen to the kidney, which is the splenorenal ligament over here. And of course, there's the ligaments that hang from the liver to the stomach in the first portion of the duodenum. When it's from the stomach to the liver, it's the gastrohepatic ligament, and almost in contiguity with it is the hepatoduodenal ligament, which is from the first portion of the duodenum to the liver. And together, of course, these two make up the lesser omentum. Now, on the free edge of the lesser omentum, somewhere in this location is going to be that foramen of Winslow that allows communication between the lesser sac and the greater sac. Now, what about the inframesocolic space? What delineates the right and left portions of it? Well, it's going to be the small bowel mesentery. Now, the small bowel mesentery extends from approximately the region of the superior mesenteric vasculature. So if we draw that in the midline, and it goes to the right lower quadrant, something like this. So that's gonna be the mesentery that's drawn in uh, red over here, small bowel mesentery. And that splits the inframesocolic space into a right portion over here and a left portion over here. Now both the right and left portions are delineated laterally by the ascending colon and the descending colon respectively. Inferiorly, the right mesocolic space is delineated by the mesentery, so it's almost a trapped space over here that doesn't allow free communication of any potential fluid to the pelvis. The left side, on the other hand, is free to communicate with the pelvis as can be seen over here. Now the peritoneal spaces of the pelvis are also free to communicate laterally with the paracolic gutters that are seen over here on the right side and on the left side over here. Now as the paragolic gutter goes superiorly, in this location approximately would be Morrison's pouch, that's one of the more dependent portions of the pelvis, and this is in contiguity the right subphrenic space. Right below the liver over here is an additional space which, you know, can argue is also a part of the hepatorenal recess of Morrison's pouch, so sometimes we give this a special name right over here, and that's known as the subhepatic space. Now on the left side of the paracolic gutter, for the most part, will communicate with the left subphrenic space. Uh, there is a ligament called the phrenical colic ligament, which we've alluded to earlier, that goes from the colon, actually the splenic flexure, to the diaphragm. So that's the phrenical colic ligament over here. And that's kind of invariably present in people and uh, forms a potential barrier to the free passage of fluid um, to the left subtronic space. And finally, I'll just finish off by drawing the uh, greater omentum, which is going to be hanging from the stomach like a big apron that goes over the anterior abdominal cavity, just like this. And there you have it, a couple of diagrams that uh, go through some peritoneal anatomy.